Okay, let's orient ourselves to the grand world of parasites. So remember, when we think about microorganisms, we think about four large groups. We think of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Now, parasites and fungi are eukaryotic organisms. That means they have a true nucleus, they have cell membranes. Parasites are often also multicellular. As far as fungi go, they can be multicellular or unicellular. Look at the fungi video for more information on that. So when we think about parasites though, we have to kind of separate what the word parasite means from what we define it as. Uh, for an organism. So a parasite is anything that needs to live off of something else um, in order to survive and causes disease. Um, viruses technically behave in a parasitic fashion. They need to invade our cells to replicate, to survive, and to spread. Um, but they are not considered parasites from a microbiology perspective. So that's what I mean by kind of separating what those two words mean. So I love this quote, a parasitologist is one who happily spends many uncomfortable hours performing autopsies on animals that are not always freshly dead, wallowing in blood or intestinal contents, and studying the excreta of man or animals. And that is because parasites find some truly awful places to hang out and also cause some really awful um, effects in these various body tissues. So it's estimated that parasitic infections are actually some of the most common and devastating throughout the world. Um, medical parasitology is the study of invertebrate animals which are capable of causing disease in humans and other animals. Parasitic diseases are frequently considered tropical. Um, however, increasingly, particularly with global warming being what it is, we're seeing tourists, missionaries, Peace Corps volunteers, and others who are um, experiencing um, parasitic infections, and particularly those who work for prolonged periods of times in endemic areas where parasites are found. Um, in the U.S., parasites are still um, not often a major cause of infection. That's not to say we don't have them, but our number of parasitic infections is much lower than in other areas of the world. But rest assured, parasites are everywhere. All free living species have at least one and frequently more parasitic species that colonize it. Um, there are parasitic organisms, there are more parasitic organisms in the world than free living organisms. Why? Because why do the work when somebody else will do it for you? It's kind of the mantra of parasites. Um, so that's kind of what we need to think of. And the biggest one of this is malaria. Um, malaria is a huge problem worldwide. Um, drug resistant malaria is an even bigger problem worldwide. Um, malaria is caused by plasmodia. Um, these are the, this is the genera of um, organisms that lead to malarial infections. I'm going to talk a lot about parasitic life cycle and I'm going to reiterate this um, during your education, but the only parasitic life cycle that I absolutely insist you know forwards, backwards, inside out, can draw it on a cocktail napkin out with your family and friends is the life cycle for Plasmodia. Um, we have drugs that treat it, but like I said, resistance is growing and it's kind of a big deal. The rest of them that we'll talk about, things like Leishmaniasis, Schisto, Trichoriasis, um, Ascaris, all of these we'll talk about, but um, the life cycle is particularly important for malaria. All right, so let's cover some ground rules for parasitology. Um, these are eukaryotic organisms and they do not have cell walls. Instead, what they have is tegument, which is a thick outer covering, but it's not a cell wall like we expect with like plant species or fungi. Um, there are kind of two major types of parasites. Um, there are single-celled parasites, which are protozoans, and then there are multicellular or, uh, parasites, which are 
metazoans. Um, the metazoans are largely worms. Um, helminths, um, helminths are further split down into two other categories, platyhelminths or nematodes. Okay, so your platyhelminths think flat like a plate, so they're flatworms. Your nematodes are your round worms. Um, the other thing I just want to kind of lay the groundwork for is that if you are infected with a parasite, just because you have infection with a parasite does not mean that you are necessarily experiencing a disease. Parasitic burden, duration of infection, and the nature of the immune response to the parasite are also the major considerations when it comes to a parasitic infection. You'll hear me say this all the time when I talk about a specific parasitic infection, is that the majority of people exposed, 90% of the people exposed to a parasitic infection are asymptomatic. Their body clears it, it was not a big deal. However, what we see is that when we see disease, it's because there's some other factor or because the parasite burden was high. So typically, as I said before, we define parasitism as an obligatory symbiotic relationship in which one organism, the parasite, derives food or benefit at the expense and sometimes the detriment to the host. Um, this broad definition could carry across anything. Um, but we also have other ways of thinking about parasitic survival. So you can have a symbiotic relationship. This is not actually parasitism. This is um, like lichen, um, which is fungi plus an algae. So it's able to grow there. It's not causing it any damage. Everybody's living happily together. Then there's mutualism. Um, this is a codependent relationship. Um, so there are actually protozoans, so single-celled uh, parasites, that live inside the gastrointestinal tract of termites. Um, anybody who has, you know, ever concerned themselves with termites know that termites will eat wood on your house and cause you problems. Well, the termites are only able to eat that wood because the protozoan is in their gastrointestinal tract helping them to digest it. So this is a mutually beneficial relationship. The termite gets to eat the wood and the protozoan also gets to eat the wood and helps out the termite, so it works out well. Commensalism, um, this is symbiosis without harm. Um, so uh, an example would be like a remora and a shark, okay? So they're living together near each other. The remora isn't helping the shark. The shark isn't helping the remora, but they're both benefiting from the dynamic anyway. Parasitism occurs when we harm the host. So an infection with a parasite might not lead to disease, but if it's leading to harm, then that is considered parasitism. So I already mentioned that I'm going to talk about parasitic life cycle a lot because that's one way we can understand parasites. But the only parasite that I actually truly require you to know is for malaria, right? right? Plasmodium. Um, but we're going to think about the life cycle as a way to frame our questions surrounding parasites. So basically there are four basic questions you have to ask regarding every parasite when you think a patient has a parasitic infection. Um, and the first question is essentially this, how did my patient get this parasite? Or how did I get this parasite? And this is really asking about transmission. Transmission is gonna involve three factors. First off, where did it come from? What is the source? And this typically means the reservoir. This means where does this parasite normally live? Where would I be likely to encounter it? Um, the second one would basically be the mode of transmission. Um, so for many organisms, the mode of transmission is a vector. So for instance, for malaria, malaria is transmitted via a mosquito vector. So a bite from the mosquito leads to you becoming infected with that parasite. Um, and then the third factor actually has something to do with the presence of a susceptible host. So let's start with kind of mode of transmission over here. So the vector could be something um, mechanical. 
Um, now, a mechanical vector is a very specific thing. This means that just by virtue of something moving from one place to another, you're exposed. Um, the example I use for this actually isn't a parasite. It's um, chlamydia trachomatis. There are these eye-seeking flies that they land on your eye to take a, a drink of basically um, the fluid surrounding your eye. And they pick up chlamydia trachomatis from your eye, and then they fly over to the next person and land on their eye, dropping off some chlamydia on their way. So that's a mechanical vector. The fly moved from one person's eyes to another person's eyes and left disease in its wake. A biologic vector requires an essential period of growth or development with in the vector. So for example, malaria needs to not just infect you, it needs to infect the mosquito that bites you in order for that mosquito to transmit it to another host. This means the mosquito is part of the life cycle of the organism. Now let's talk about susceptible hosts. When we think about parasites, there are a couple different hosts we need to keep in mind. So the reservoir might be a host that doesn't necessarily experience disease from the pathogen. Um, that's normally what a reservoir is. It's where the pathogen lives, but it doesn't often cause disease in that particular host. The host could be a definitive host or an intermediate host. A definitive host is the final host. This is the host in which the adult form of the parasite can be found or where sexual reproduction takes place. Um, so this is the, the, final, the final stage of parasite development, okay? An intermediate host is a host which harbors an intermediate form. So a good example of this is actually the parasite Toxoplasma gondii. Toxoplasma gondii can infect humans. And in humans, we can see adult or sexually reproducing forms, okay? But it also needs to spend time in cats. So cats become an intermediate form or an intermediate host for that pathogen. So I'll kind of go through this quickly because I mostly said this. The source of the parasite in the environment is the reservoir. The definitive host, that's the sexual or adult parasitic area. The intermediate harbors an asexual or larval stage. And the vector is able to move the organism from one person to another. And it can do that in a mechanical form where it's literally just moving or a biological where the vector is actually infected as well. Okay, so let's get back into our question. So the first one that we have to answer is how did they get it? And that's transmission. The second question is how do I diagnose the parasite in my patient? Um, if we don't think about the life cycle at all, we won't know what we're looking for. You could be looking for a cyst or an egg or a worm. If you don't know what the diagnostic form is, if you're looking for a cyst and you should be looking for a worm, that's gonna be a big problem. So you need to think about what stage you're looking for. Um, this is actually the life cycle for malaria, if you wanna start memorizing this. Um, but you can see that throughout, there are different stages that we see in humans, and then there are stages that we would see in the mosquito as well. Um, so we're gonna need to know that. The other thing we need to ask is how does it actually cause disease? So as parasites mature, some of stages of their maturity are pathogenic and some aren't. Um, often it's the host immune or inflammatory response against dead parasites that actually causes disease. Um, sometimes the parasite burden can be so great as to actually impede the function of an organ um, and use up vital nutrients or restrict blood or lymph flow. So we have all of these reasons for why it might be causing disease. Um, this also gets that life cycle of the different stages because we're going to want to treat the stage of disease or the stage of the parasite that is causing disease. So for example, in malaria, we see rupture of erythrocytes, right? So um, as, the, uh, as the organism grows in our red blood cells, our red blood cells burst, and that can actually lead to disease. Um, it's not the replication that occurs in the liver that causes damage. It's normally the replication causing in the red blood cell that leads to disease.
Okay, the last and I think kind of most important question to answer is how do I avoid a parasite? Um, nobody really wants to get one in the first place. Um, and this is also how we can prevent it. So for example, with malaria, we've tried mosquito netting, spraying for paras or, or for mosquitoes, introducing asexual mosquitoes into the wild. All of this is for creating preventative measures on kind of a social scale, um, which when feasible are usually preferable to chemotherapeutic measures, which might be used to inhibit the life cycle of the pathogen. Um, this is actually just a fun story. This um, little parasite here, Cymothia exigua, um, is actually one of my favorite parasites. This parasite infects this fish here. And then it eats the fish's tongue and becomes the fish's tongue and slowly starves the fish from inside because it gets to eat all the food before the fish does. Isn't that a pleasant thought? So we'll talk more about parasites when you arrive on campus.